Good afternoon and welcome to the SPX Technologies Q3 2024 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then 1 on your telephone keypad. To withdraw from the question queue, please press star then 2. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Paul Clegg, Vice President, Investor Relations and Communications. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. With me on the call today are Gene Lowe, our President and Chief Executive Officer, and Mark Carano, our Chief Financial Officer. A press release containing our third quarter results was issued today after market close. You can find the release in our earnings slide presentation as well as a link to a live webcast of this call in the Investor Relations section of our website at spx.com. I encourage you to review our disclosure and discussion of GAAP results in the press release and to follow along with the slide presentation during our prepared remarks. The replay of the webcast will be available on our website. As a reminder, portions of our presentation and comments are forward-looking and subject to safe harbor provisions. Please also note the risk factors in our most recent SEC filings. Our comments today will largely focus on adjusted financial results and comparisons will be to the results of continuing operations only. You can find detailed reconciliations of historical adjusted figures from the respective gap measures in the appendix to today's presentation. Our adjusted earnings per share exclude acquisition-related costs, non-service pension items, mark-to-market changes, amortization expense, and other items. Finally, we will be meeting with investors at various events during the fourth quarter, including at the Baird Global Industrials Conference on November 13th, the Wolf Research Conference on December 4th, and the Sedoti Small Cap Conference on December 5th. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Gene. Thanks, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. And the call today will provide you with an update on our consolidated and segment results for the third quarter of 2024 and discuss our outlook for the remainder of the year. Our Q3 results reflect solid revenue growth and substantial increases in our key profit measures. Our margin performance was strong across both segments and we continue to execute on our key value creation initiatives, including sustainability and continuous improvement. We are well positioned to achieve our full year guidance, which reflects a year-on-year -year increase in adjusted EBITDA of approximately 35% and an increase in adjusted EPS of 28%. Turning to our high-level results, for the third quarter, we grew revenue by 7.8%, driven by strength in HVAC cooling. Adjusted EBITDA increased approximately 27% year-on-year with 320 basis points of margin expansion. As always, I'd like to update you on our value creation efforts during the quarter. On the sustainability front, we recently published our annual sustainability report reflecting <coughs> another year of progress across our key initiatives. In particular, we achieved a 30% reduction in carbon intensity well ahead of schedule and introduced several new climate-conscious solutions that help reduce our customers' power usage, emissions, and water usage. We also continue to see progress in our continuous improvement initiatives, including benefits from significant capital investments in equipment and processes that add to production capacity by improving throughput. We have continued to see incremental margin gains as a result of investments to improve efficiency. And now, I'll turn the call over to Mark to review our financial results. Thanks, Gene. Our third quarter results were strong. Year-on-year, -year, adjusted EPS grew 31% to $1.39. For the quarter, total company revenue increased 7.8% year-on-year. Organically, revenue grew 3% while acquisitions drove an increase of 4.4%, FX was a modest tailwind. Consolidated segment income grew by $22.2 million, or 24.2%, to $113.8 million, while segment margin increased 310 basis points. For the quarter, in our HVAC segment, 
revenues grew 15.9% year-on-year. On an organic basis, revenues increased 9%, driven by continued strength in cooling demand, while heating was similar to the prior year. The acquisition of Ingenia in our cooling platform contributed growth of 6.8%, while the FX impact was nominal. Segment income grew by $21.7 million, or 37.2%, while segment margin increased 370 basis points. The increases in segment income and margin were due to operating leverage on higher organic cooling sales and the Ingenia acquisition. Segment backlog at quarter end was $438 million, up modestly from Q3. For the quarter and the detection and measurement segment, Revenues decreased 7% year-on-year. FX was a 0.8% tailwind. The decrease in revenue was driven largely by lower contact sales associated with a large pass-through project delivered during 2023 and into the first quarter of 2024. Excluding the pass-through project, revenue grew approximately 3%, driven by transportation and ATON project sales. Year-on-year segment income through $0.5 million, and margin increased 190 basis points, driven by more favorable project mix. Segment income margin also continued to benefit from our efforts to enhance the efficiency of our segment structure. Segment backlog at quarter end was $193 million, down 5.8% sequentially from Q3, reflecting the timing of certain project deliveries and awards. Turning now to our financial position at the end of the quarter. We ended Q3 with cash of $129 million and total debt of $738 million. Our leverage ratio is calculated under our bank credit agreement of 1.4 times. We now anticipate our leverage ratio declining to 1.2 times or lower by year end, below our target range of 1.5 to 2.5 times, assuming no additional capital deployment. Adjusted free cash flow for the quarter was approximately $61 million. During the quarter, we amended our credit agreement to double the size of our revolving credit facility to $1 billion in order to better match our increased size and growth opportunities. Moving on to our guidance. We are maintaining our full year guidance for adjusted EBITDA and adjusted EPS. We are narrowing the range of our HVAC revenue guidance to $1.365 billion to $1.385 billion, reflecting year-on-year growth of 22.5% at the midpoint. We are also slightly narrowing our range for HVAC margin guidance while maintaining the midpoint of 23.5%, or a 260 basis points increase year-on-year. In DNM, based on our year-to-date performance and outlook, we are increasing our margin guidance to a range of 21.25% to 22% raising the midpoint to approximately 21.6%. This represents a year-on-year increase of approximately 240 basis points, compared with a year-on-year increase of 210 basis points previously. In total, consolidated midpoint segment income for the company remains unchanged as a result of these adjustments. As always, you'll find modeling considerations in the appendix to our presentation. I'm now turning the call back over to Gene for a review of our end markets and his closing comments. Thanks, Mark. Current market conditions continue to support our outlook. Within our HVAC cooling platform, we continue to see strong demand for our products across several key end markets, including data centers, healthcare, and institutional. In our HVAC heating platform, winter temperatures are a key driver of year-end demand, as is typical. In our detection and measurement segment, we continue to experience flattish global demand in our short cycle business with regional variations while project orders remain healthy. Looking ahead, we anticipate ending the year with a solid backlog position, leaving us well positioned for growth in 2025. In summary, I'm pleased with SPX's Q3 results, including significant margin expansion in both segments. We're well positioned to achieve our updated full year guidance, which implies 35% growth in adjusted EBITDA and 28% growth in adjusted EPS. We see multiple opportunities to continue growing our businesses, both organically 
and for our attractive acquisition pipeline. Looking ahead, I remain excited about our future. The right strategy and a highly capable, experienced team, I see significant opportunity to continue driving value for years to come. And with that, I'll turn the call back to Paul. Thanks, Gene. Operator, we will now go to questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star than one on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw from the question queue, please press star then two. At this time, we'll pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question will come from Ross Sparenbleck with William Blair. You may now go ahead. Hey, good evening, guys. Hey, Ross. Hey, good evening. Hey, you know, strong HVAC order growth there in the quarter, um, with the Dodge and the Index continuing to climb and all the work you guys have done to uh, streamline the uh, the sales process. How should we think about the sustainability of, you know, the 2024 growth rates into 2025? I mean, is it a fair base case to underwrite mid-teens for cooling and still double digits for the overall business? So Ross, yeah. First of all, I want to be want to be careful. We don't uh, we get into a discussion about uh, 2025 uh, too early. I, I think we you know we've had a uh, you know strong year here with respect so far uh, with respect to organic growth on the on the cooling side. We've benefited from some of the um, acquisitions we've done as well. Obviously, we've also done some significant um, uh, throughput improvements that have expanded our capacity. Um, yeah, I'd say largely as we look in, as we look into next year, we feel good about the um, the strength of those markets that have benefited us this year. So we're looking at data centers and healthcare and, and institutional. Um, on on the, so you know from the cooling side, I'd say that's um, we still feel pretty good about where we stand. Yeah, I understood until twenty five. Maybe I'm just trying to understand the timing of when we should expect order flow from a, uh, you know, recovering Dodge index to hit your books if it hasn't already. Is more to come, or is this already starting to bleed through the numbers? Ross, well, so, I mean, I'm not sure the Dodge index is a perfect proxy for for all of our HVAC business. Uh, yeah, about 70% of its replacement, which is not really linked to the Dodge index. Exactly. So you really need to be thinking about both the replacement dynamic as well as the new build. And then you think about some of these these markets that Paul just mentioned, you know, like data centers, like healthcare, uh, institutional, some of the reshoring we're seeing. I mean, the thematic trends there really haven't changed. Um, you know, they continue to be uh, strong markets. Um, we see those continuing, you know, through the fourth quarter and you know, in the next year. Fair enough. Uh, and maybe just on the boiler side, uh, it was a little surprising to see flat growth, just kind of given the you know new product launches and share gains you guys have seen there, and some of the intra-quarter read-throughs we've seen from you know at least the commercial side. Uh, is there anything we should read into the fourth quarter as we look at uh, you know seasonally low comp for Resi? Yeah, I think I mean Ross, it, it was um, a slower start to the heating season uh, this year uh, than we had initially uh, anticipated. Um, so, you know, that in conjunction with the fact that really the lead times uh, in our in our business, um, in our boiler business, have kind of normalized. They're no longer extended. If you recall last year, they were they were still at, at uh, you know longer than normal lead times. Um, you know, so we're seeing the distributors, you know, at least manage their inventory levels a little more prudently than perhaps they have in the past. So. It really, but but at the end of the day, it's you know it's largely driven by you know the weather dynamics, and uh, you know we just haven't seen the heating season kick in yet. As you know, when it does, it you know it can turn quickly. This is an 80 percent replacement business, so uh, it, you know that that business will really start to ramp up once uh, once you see the weather dynamics shift. All right, well, I think yeah, yeah. With with respect to our guide, and, you know, when you think about the um, you know, the balance of the year, we, you know, we have uh, kind of adjusted our guide, if you will, take into account, you know, a delayed start to the heating season. 
Yeah, well, it's easy to mention the Resi versus uh, commercial. And, yeah, I think we are stronger on the commercial side. I think Resi, which is a much more replacement uh, market, is where we're, we are seeing uh, more of the flattest flatness. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Our next question will come from Brian Blair with Oppenheimer. You may now go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. Hey, Brian. I'd like to dig in on detection and measurement, uh, starting with your your run rate business. Um, you know, just your your team's perspective on you know sustainability of, of demand and perhaps uh, you know near term and, and inflection. You know, the the commentary on the slides I, I may simply be reading into this you know too much, but flattish. You actually said in the script, uh, Jane, but uh, mm-hmm. flattish turned to mixed global demand in terms of, of run rate, is there anything that we should read into there? And in terms of regional variation, uh, you know, what uh, what is your team, you know, seeing currently? And then looking forward in terms of, you know, project business, you've been very consistent in citing, you know, healthy underlying demand, um, infrastructure spending being on the horizon. Uh, how should we think about the setup for, you know, project activity and, you uh, you know, perhaps catalyst going into 2025. Yeah, Brian, let me let me start. I think that I wouldn't read anything too, too much into that word. I mean, I think in, in general, you know, the run rate has been flattish with, with, with very, very modest growth. There is regional variation. Um, you know, as you know, at a company level, we're approximately 85% North American and about 15% equally split in Europe. Asia. I'd say the two areas that, that appear to me to be softest would be um, China and continental Europe. Um, but I would say that our, um, uh, our relative uh, revenue there is, is fairly small. Um, obviously, much larger in North America, UK, um, Southeast Asia, and some of the other regions. Um, I would say the U.S. is holding pretty steady, um, and I would say overall we're cautiously optimistic. You know, looking into 2025, you want to be careful about not giving 2025 guidance. I would also say the project activity, as we've talked about, is healthy, um, and there's a lot of large projects uh, that we're bidding on. The big thing we got to keep our eyes on and with is when those will actually come to fruition. There's some of these that are very large that that could start to go in 25. There's some that could start to go in 26. So, you know, really good project activity, really good uh, success rates there. But we're going to have to manage and make sure that um, we have a good handle on the the timing of the revenues of those projects. But, yeah, I would say if you look ahead to 25, HVAC, you know, if we kind of say our normal business is mid-single-digit growth, I think there's more growth drivers underneath HVAC overall, uh, whereas DNM, I would say, is probably what we're seeing a little bit lower growth uh, as we look ahead to 25. Understood. Appreciate the, the color. Uh, and maybe offer a quick update on your M&A pipeline, um, you know, how – you know, frame however you may, you know, your, your team's confidence in uh, uh, executing a deal and, you know, over the coming quarters. And uh, also, uh, I, I guess, speak to the composition of your, your pipeline. What intrigues me is with your, you know, leverage moving below targeted range, having expanded uh, your credit facility to, you know, to a billion. You're, you're going to enter 2025 with a tremendous amount of dry powder. Uh, are there, you know, potential deals out there that would actually utilize that kind of capacity, or is it, you know, simply flexing to the scale of current operations? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think you're, you're spot on. I think that we're obviously going to be below. We we'll generate, our, as you know, our business is generate so much cash. I do think one thing, you know, our EBITDA has expanded so much, right? You know, when we got our revolver in place, our EBITDA was almost well below half of what it is today. And so part of it is just getting the appropriate size uh, 
evolved or with your strategy. Um, so we feel very good about that. But having said that, we actually feel really good with our pipeline. And I would say the activity level is very strong on the M&A side. Um, this is on the uh, DNM side and as well as on the HVAC side. So there's a good level of activity. Um, and um, you know, I actually feel, feel optimistic about what we're seeing over the next 12 months in terms of the ability to keep building out our platforms. I think there should be some really good opportunities there. You know, where we're seeing it, I, I would say, you know, we see some very interesting opportunities on the location and inspection side, on the contact side, on the transportation side. Um, and then if you flip over to HVAC, uh, we see some very good engineered air movement as well as some cooling uh, intriguing opportunities in, in, in those five platforms. So uh, it does feel like there's a lot going on. And, uh, you know, with our new revolver and our, our relatively low, uh, you know, multiple you know, debt to the ratio, you're right, we do have the dry powder to, to grow. Excellent. That's encouraging. Thanks again. Thanks, Brian. Our next question will come from Damian Karas with UBS. You may now go ahead. Hey, good morning. Good, excuse me. Good evening, gentlemen. It's been a long day. Good morning, Damian. <laughs> oh goodness, it's been it's been a long uh, long few weeks. Um, weeks. Light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe just a follow, couple follow-up questions on, on D&M here. Uh, I just want to make sure first I heard correctly that that you had a, a single project that had a 10-point impact on the quarter, and otherwise D&M would have been uh, up 3% organically. Did I hear correctly? Uh, uh, I, I know what you're talking about, Damien. Yeah, so, no, we're actually just giving you the uh, – this is Paul, by the way. We're uh, giving you the math without the – Pass through projects that delivered in the prior year. You may remember that in the communication technologies business, we had a large pass through project, uh, lower than the typical margin associated with it, and that delivered through last year and into uh, the first quarter of this year. Um, that's tended to skew our results all year, and so as we do the year over year comparisons, we just gave that math. Okay, I see. Well, let me ask you just the margin seems pretty strong considering sales were off 7% versus last year. So could you give us a sense, like, were there some mix impacts, you know, related to that stronger margin? How much would have that been versus just kind of the operating initiatives that uh, you've been working on? Yeah, Damien, I mean, it's really a mix of both. Um, you know, we have been very intentional around – the segment as we pulled it together and looked for operational efficiencies and uh, opportunities to drive margin, whether that's um, that's across sourcing or IT, all sorts of initiatives related to, to bringing all these businesses together under one roof or, or one segment. And then, you know, as you mentioned, um, you know, we did have a favorable mix of projects in the quarter um, from a margin perspective. You know, these projects, as you know, uh, as they execute, and they, they have a, a variety of margin profiles across them. And, and in this case, in Q3, we had a slightly higher margin profile uh, given the mix that, that landed within the quarter, you know, relative to, um, to uh, I think, what we had initially anticipated. I think the team's done nice work driving margins. If you look at last year versus this year, the actions that they've taken on productivity, on pricing, on some different uh, synergy areas have been very beneficial. So, you know, we've been talking about detection and measurement margins for a little while. We're really, it's really nice to see the, the, the progress they're making. Yeah, I might add, you probably saw, Danny, we obviously raised our, our midpoint guidance for, um, for DNM for the year as well, uh, reflecting that many of those activities. So now I think the midpoint is 21.6, which is up from 21.25. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's great to see. 
Uh, and then stay, staying on DNM, I just, you know, the, 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 the updated guide for the year, just the, the range seemed pretty, pretty wide um, for just one quarter left. Uh, anything to, to read into that? No, I mean, really, it's just the timing of uh, it's just the timing of projects, and I think that's been a we've had a fair number of chunky projects this year, and as we look at the timing of those, that's caused us to have to kind of revisit uh, which ones fall into which quarter during the year. Um, so I think you know, on average, we feel really good about where we are um, going into the fourth quarter. You'll see that the midpoint uh, implies something in the mid 150s on revenue, and uh, pretty healthy margin. Okay, got it. I'll get back in the queue. Thanks. Thanks. Our next question will come from Walt Liptak with Seaport Research. You may now go ahead. Hi, thanks. I'd like to say good morning to everybody, too. It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Walt, well, good morning to you, bud. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I wanted to ask about, um, you know, an HVAC, just like the uh, the cadence of orders, you know, sounds like, you know, some of the data center and healthcare is doing fine. I wonder if you could talk about the order cadence there. And then uh, with the boilers, you know, it's, the weather has clearly been a lot warmer this year and you don't have that, you know, the supply chain issues or whatever from last year. But what is normal for boilers? Like when do, when do you usually start seeing your, you know, distributors, uh, you know, starting to take up? you know, boiler inventory. Yeah, so uh, that, that, uh, this year um, we, we typically were expecting to see some of that start in September. We did not see much of that, uh, as uh, Mark referred to earlier. You did see some distributors, uh, you know, holding off as the lead times have come down, um, and you're more or less at just-in-time lead times. Um, and... Uh, you know, with warm weather, the, there's uh, it, this puts them in a position to be able to save a little bit on their inventory management. Um, you know, look, I, I, they, you should start to see that in the uh, winter as the winter months kick in here as we roll through. Um, at this point, you're right; it's still warm in October, um, and we've accounted for that in our guide for the for the fourth quarter. So I think we feel good about where we've set guidance based on what we know so far about the fourth quarter. If you were to look at it versus historical levels, um, it's one of the, we're forecasting it at one of the lowest levels that we've seen um, over the last, uh, you know, close to the last decade here, with the exception of last year, which was particularly weak. Um, so we're still expecting a little bit of year-over-year -year growth in the fourth quarter uh, in heating. Last year was particularly weak. You had sort of a double whammy impact of uh, it being very warm, in addition to that kind of destocking taking place in a sort of post-COVID environment. Okay, great. And then the, the cadence of orders, how do they look for the, you know, the data center healthcare? Overall, we're feeling really, really good while on what we're seeing there. I would say healthcare, the biggest uh, opportunities there would be uh, Ingenia. Uh, customary handling, which is is really getting some nice awards, even even starting to book into 26, uh, very long lead times there. Um, and Strobic, a uh, portion of our EAM, seeing some nice nice growth there. Data centers remain strong, I would say, in all three regions. Um, in the U.S., uh, some nice projects in Europe and, and, and in Asia as well. So. Yeah, I think the progression is, is good. And then I'd say more so in North America, institutional still remains strong. Uh, schools, governments, universities, things like that. A good amount of um, replacement activity that seems to be uh, very healthy right now as we, okay. as we sit today and as we look ahead to 25. Okay, great. Um, and then switching over to DNM, you guys called out ATON. I can't remember if that was – that was in a good trend in the second quarter too, but I, I wonder if you could just talk about Aton and what you're seeing there, any kind of, you know, order funnel or <clears throat> project, um, you know, visibility you might have. Aton's had a very good year. We're actually very pleased with their progression this year, both in top line growth and margin growth. Um, 
you know, we're very, very pleased. I think that, you know, there's a good chunk of that. I'd say the majority of that is run rate. You know, so you're always keeping your eye on the global run rate. That's a very global business, serves Europe, Northern Europe, Southeast Asia, Canada, North America. Very good presence with it, with a very clear leader there, uh, we believe, globally. Um, so, yeah, we, we've had a really good year there, and I'd say – Nothing that signals, uh, you know, any 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 fall off there. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Our next question will come from Steve Ferrazzani with Sadoti. You may now go ahead. Evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to check in on, on on capacity additions. I know the plan was to you were in process of expanding with Ingenia. Um, just wanted to check on where that progress is in terms of your ability to grow that business beyond the, the, the current markets it serves. Yeah, I would say, Steve, it's very positive. And, you know, one of the ways you can look at it is how much you're getting out each quarter. And uh, we've, we've had nice expansion in Q4, and we see more expansion uh, going into next year. You know, it's a good situation to be in where you have a very high level of demand. You know, you got to get the product out the door. You have to make sure. And there's a lot of – that's a very automated, very um, – a lot of robotics in there. It's a, it's a really a, a nice business. But, you know, we're – you know, it's still um, – it's, it's, it's substantially small. You know, it's much smaller than our cooling products, but we're seeing some very nice growth there. So you will see some – attractive year over year, year growth uh, from 24 to 25 in that distance. Great. And, and are you where you need to be with Marley now with the expansion? Is, is that expansion all completed? Do you have plenty of do you have room to run on that side? Yeah, actually that's gone exceptionally well. Not only has that driven more margin uh, and throughput, um, it, it's been very, very positive. Uh, we have brought our lead times back to uh, very competitive levels, uh, and actually we believe we're at or below our two primary competitors there uh, with the productivity initiatives we're putting in place. So um, it's uh, it's a really we feel really good about those investments, and it's you really see it pay dividends on the margin line and on the top line line. So we, you know, we feel good about those, and uh, we we have we have more runway going into 25. Excellent. Uh, you mentioned industrial reshoring again. Do you have any sense of where we are with that? And, and are you still seeing demand coming from additional reshoring? You know, I think that there are some projects there, and the interesting thing is is you know, once something reshores, it's, you know, it's not necessarily a one-time thing, right? Let's say you bring a car plant here or, an elect, you know, a, a semiconductor plant here, you put cooling towers on it or you put, uh, you know, whatever products you put on there, those products need to be maintained on an ongoing basis and in place. And so... You know, you, well, what has happened, it's not a one-time project. You you have expanded your TAM, and the subsequent, you know, aftermarket OEM parts, service, et cetera, will be there. So, you know, what I would say is the, uh, you know, there's still projects that we are working on. We have seen a couple that have slowed down, some, um, some associated with electric vehicles. We've seen some delays there. But um, those, as a percentage of our overall revenue, are relatively small in the grand context of the segment revenue. So it, it's been uh, way uh, – you don't even see it because of the growth in some of the other areas. But, but there's still a good amount of activity, I would say, on that side. Too. Excellent. Uh, last one for me. Uh, obviously, another very strong cash flow quarter. Uh, are, is the intention still to, until some deals come up, uh, to pay down debt in the near term? 
Yeah, Steve, I mean, uh, you know, that, that, that would be our intention, I think, in the near term to, to, uh, to continue to reduce uh, the debt that we had outstanding, um, you know, in the interim period before we have a transaction. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Again, if you have a question, please press star then 1. Our next question will be a follow-up from Damien Caros with UBS. You may now go ahead. Hey again, guys. Uh, one you thing I wanted to ask you, but I wanted to ask you, uh, um, didn't hear the word hurricane mentioned, and I know obviously uh, you guys are headquartered in the Carolinas and have some uh, facilities uh, kind of in the southeast U.S. here. Just wanted to ask whether you had any impacts in the quarter um, from the two hurricanes that we've had recently. And and second to that, just, you know, considering your solutions, particularly, particularly in B&M, um, whether you see any potential, you know, kind of uh, uplift activity from some of the rebuild and restoration post-storm. Yeah, Damien, we, we did not, uh, we were not impacted by the hurricane, really, directly. None of our facilities were, um, you know, uh, one was obviously in the line of it in Florida where we had our Q's business, but, but it was not, not impacted. So, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, we did not, uh, have to deal with any, any issues with respect to that. Um, with regard to your second question, you know, I wouldn't say that we've seen really any meaningful activity with respect to, um, you know, damage, you know, that, that, that was caused by the hurricane where we would have replacement activity. Um, but it's early days, I think, on that front. So uh, you're right. Uh, some of our solutions would clearly be well positioned, whether that's on the Q side of the business or Aton, uh, you know, if they work through the rebuild. And I'd say the other area, sometimes when you have these weather events, you'll see, you know, that goes through a more industrial area, uh, cooling towers, you know, fan stacks, things like that. So we have, um, we're working to identify how we can support. Uh, we haven't seen anything materially significant at this point in time, but we're working to support where we can. Got it. Thank you for that. And I wanted to ask you about nuclear which has become quite topical all of a sudden uh, in the investor world. And, and I know um, that your business has had a, a pretty solid position in, in some areas of, of nuclear, um, nuclear power gen. So could you maybe just – and, in fact, I think, you know, you, you had talked about a, um, uh, uh, a nice cooling project last quarter. We think that you might have been um, involved in a – uh, a nuclear um, uh, plant and doing some work there. But just, just thinking about all of the, you know, nuclear activity we're hearing from some of these uh, tech companies that are trying to get data center capacity built out, built out you know, what is the potential opportunity there for, um, for SPX? And Jamie, you know, what I would say is, um, I think it's a net benefit for our power business, you know, for the, for the power portion, which is, not a humongous portion of our business these days, but our process cooling. As you know, the majority of the cooling towers that are in nuclear facilities are really Mars. It's really, uh, and, you know, we do service work and provide OEM parts. You're right, we have to, we do do some, some larger projects. I think net net, um, you know, the, the growth in data centers is really going to be burdening the grid. Um, you, you've had a grid that has for so long had very little growth in demand, uh, and you actually are seeing real growth in demand, and so you have to find more capacity. New capacity takes a while to get into place. Even if you put in the fastest, you know, source, you're probably talking a couple of years, you know, for a, a peaker plant or a natural gas plant. Nukes take much longer, but what I would say is you're going to see some more activity on working on your nuke plants because anytime you upgrade your cooling tower, you get a lot more power out of your, out of your plant. So I, I do think, and we are seeing a lot of activity uh, on some, some service projects. The other thing, you know, there are some small modular nuclear reactors 
we're typically the first person they call when they're looking for a cooling tower. Uh, there's like a good amount of activity there, but what I would say is that's something that's a little further out, you know, to the to get get to the point at which there'd be actual revenue. It's pro I would say, you know, you're probably not going to see anything material for a couple of years there. I do think it's an interesting opportunity. It will be interesting to see if it actually you know, gets fully uh, approved and commissioned. But if it does, we think that we're very well positioned to take advantage of that opportunity. So, yeah, I would say on that segment, um, there's a there's a growing level of activity, and, and I would expect that to continue with the pressure that the uh, utilities have to generate more megawatts. Appreciate your thoughts. Thanks a lot. Best of luck, guys. Thanks. This concludes our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the conference back over to Paul Clegg for any closing remarks. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to updating you again next quarter and seeing many of you at conferences and at one-on-ones throughout the quarter. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.